Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me to Philippians chapter 4. We have a few more weeks left in this series of taboo, and we are going to talk about a, a few different subjects. Uh, this morning, we're going to talk about uh, depression and uh, some things that we can do to enhance our, our mental health, and I think that's important, especially in light of uh, some things that our country has uh, experienced this last week. Uh, then one of the next three weeks, we're going to talk uh, uh, about money. One of the next three weeks, we're going to talk about sex. Shh, can you do that in church, Pastor? Yes, we can. And uh, then when we get uh, towards Halloween, uh, we'll talk about uh, things that are satanic and, and things like that, and a little bit about Halloween and stuff like that. So uh, I hope you guys are enjoying this series. I know we've got some great responses on the Internet. We've got some great views on YouTube. And uh, these are things that I uh, hope you're also passing along to people as, as you go. But we do have a, a problem in our nation with mental health. And, you know, it, it, it is not normal for a man to take dozens of guns into a hotel room and break out a window and begin shooting uh, people, innocent, random people on the street. And you cannot do that without you having something wrong in your mind. And there are, there are many, many people all over this country that have uh, committed random acts of violence like this because there is a, a problem in our nation. And there's a lot of speculation as to what's causing these things and what would motivate a person to do this type of thing. And, you know, some people think it's because it's a lot of the things we're putting in our food, because this is stuff that, you know, you, you didn't see 60, 80 years ago, even 50 years ago. So many kids that are struggling with ADD and so many people that are struggling with bipolar disease and depression and things like that. Either it wasn't here or it wasn't diagnosed, one of the two. But it seems to be more and more evident in, in our world that we live in today. Uh, I looked at some statistics this week, and uh, Mental Health America says that over 40 million Americans, uh, adults, have had a mental health condition of some sort. That's one in five. So look around you this morning. You know, a lot of times the, this is something we don't want to talk about because we don't want to admit it. And a lot of times it gets undiagnosed and untreated, and then that's what, what happens when somebody breaks out windows of a hotel room and begins to, to shoot because nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to admit it. Nobody wants to deal with these type of things that are happening in our world. More than one in 10 teenagers, youth, battle depression. Depression is the leading cause of disability among adults in the United States. And only 36% of those who struggle actually get help. That means there's 74% or 64% of people that struggle with mental health that will never even want to talk about it or deal with it or, or, or get any type of health uh, help. And that's, that's scary if you think about it. And so when we talk about mental health, there's a lot of different things that, that, that covers anxiety, depression, uh, OCD, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, bipolar disorder, panic attacks. All of these things are on the rise. And, and we've experienced this. You know, I've been pastoring now over 30 years. And, and I, you know, I've dealt with people that I know are bipolar. I've dealt with people that have struggled. I, there was one individual that was part of the church many years ago that, that had clinical depression issues and would oftentimes spend weeks at a time in the hospital and would have to get electrical shock treatments to help get things back into order and, and uh, you know, locked away in a room in a psychiatric unit of a hospital. And, you know, you might think, well, you know, pastor, that's that's just the extreme. And yes, yes, it is the extreme. But if, if you knew some of the people that this happened to, they're some of the sweetest, nicest, most wonderful people that you've ever met in your life. It's not like they are uh, 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 raving lunatics, you know, that, that, that struggle with these type of things uh, in our society on a daily basis. It's, it's common, ordinary people, people like you and people like me. And I've got to admit, there have been seasons in my life where I've battled some type of depression, some form of depression. And I think that all of us could probably admit that. And so I, I, I think it's important that we take this and we put it out on the table and we talk about it. And, uh, you know, we don't try to hide things and, and sweep them under the rug because that's, that's the reason why we have problems like we have in our nation today. In Philippians chapter 4, in uh, verse 6, Paul writes these words, and he says, be anxious for nothing. Anxious is just another form of the word anxiety. Paul says, don't have anxiety. Don't be anxious for anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, 
Let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatever things are just and pure and lovely and of a good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Then he says, the things which you learn and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. I believe the answers to some of what we're talking about this morning lie in this passage of Scripture right here. And we're going to break that down in, in just a moment. Well, thank you so much for tuning into our broadcast today. We hope you're enjoying it. The Word of God has the power to change lives, and He's changing lives here at Liberty. And we pray that He's changing your life too. We serve a big God, and we have a big, big vision here at Liberty, and we are exploding with excitement. We pray that you feel the same excitement wherever you're watching today. We understand that you may not always be able to make it to service on Sunday and experience the things that everybody's experiencing live in person. And we're always looking for new ways to grow and expand our ministries in the way that we bring our ministry to you. The Bible teaches us to bless those who bless us. If we've been a blessing to you in any way, we want to hear about it. Please send us an email, call us, or send us a message on social media. Please also consider sending an offering at the website address that's on your screen. It's a simple process using Easy Tithe. You can give a one-time donation with a credit card, debit card, or a bank withdrawal, or you can create an account and set it up to give automatically on a set schedule. Technology is a wonderful thing for people on the go. We want to continue to be a blessing to you in many ways, but we need your help. Your offerings allow us to record and stream our services so that you can watch them online. We want to be able to bring you the highest quality online experience possible so that you can enjoy our ministry without problems and interruptions. Please pray about what you can do to help us today. Thank you again for tuning in. We pray that God will richly bless you and your family. May these teachings radically change your life as they have ours. We pray that God meets all of your needs and that your gifts to our ministry come back to you even greater than when you gave them. We love you. We hope to see you or hear from you soon. Now we want to return you to today's service. Depression can affect some of the strongest people that you know. There's a story in 1 Kings chapter 19 about the prophet Elijah. Anybody heard about Elijah before? One of the most well-known prophets of God, did some amazing things throughout the Bible, raised a young man from the dead. God sent him to the brook Cherith and, and fed him with ravens and took care of him when there was a drought and, and, and people, there was a famine in the land. He declared to the, the evil King Ahab, it's not going to rain until I say so. And it didn't for years until he defeated the prophets of Baal, called down fire from heaven, had, had these evil prophets of Baal slaughtered and, and sacrificed and, 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 and called upon God, and rain came back to the face of the earth. I mean, Elijah had some amazing, marvelous miracles. Some of the greatest miracles in the Bible happened under Elijah's ministry. And after he killed these prophets of Baal, Ahab's wife Jezebel put a bounty out on his life. She wanted him dead. And something happened, something snapped within Elijah, one of the greatest men of God, one of the strongest prophets that you'll ever read about or ever know. And it says in 1 Kings chapter 19 and, and verse 2, it says, Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, let the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as one of the life of one of them, speaking of the prophets of Baal, by tomorrow at this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life. He went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. And he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree and prayed that he might die. And he said, it is enough now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. This is depression. Elijah, the man of God, the prophet of God, battled a season of depression. And because he wouldn't let God break through in his life, because he, 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 he wouldn't release this thing that he was battling with, because he wouldn't listen to the Lord, God said, that's it, your, your ministry is done. I want you to pass it on to Elisha. And, and uh, that was really the, the beginning of the end of his ministry as a prophet. He had so many great things, but oftentimes depression can come after our greatest triumph. This is what happened to Elijah. He had one of the greatest victories in the Bible that, that, that you'll ever read about. And then all of a sudden this happens and bam, 
he slips into a, a deep, funky depression in his life. I don't know if you've ever experienced that before. This has happened to me many times. I, I can have one of the greatest services on a Sunday morning or, or, or get done with a, an outreach like Summerfest that we had such a, a, a wonderful experience. And then the enemy will come and attack. The Bible says he comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. And he can use depression to do that. He will try to take your life just like he tried to take Elijah's life here through this spirit of depression. And I don't want you to get the, uh, the, the idea that depression is always a spirit. There are, there are other things that we're going to talk about here this morning. But it takes, depression takes a grave and exaggerated view of life. It takes things and blows them up far bigger than what they really are. And that's what was happening here with Elijah. He says, you know, there's no other people that are preaching for God. And, and, and everybody hates me. And, you know, he just began to get into this, this wild pity party. And again, there's a spirit behind this. And you have to recognize this spirit. And you have to be determined to fight against this spirit. We talked about this scripture last week in Ephesians chapter 6, where, where, where the Bible says that, that our fight's not against flesh and blood. But Paul also says a, a, a final word. He says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the armor of God that you might be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. Put on the armor of God. Be strong in the Lord. And, and stand firm against the strategies of the devil. Depression is a strategy of the devil. Amen? And God says, put on his armor. That, that's speaking of a fight. You know, you got to tell the devil, devil, if you want to fight, I'll give you one. Amen? you got to sometimes, as a Christian, you got to have a backbone. And this is where Elijah struggled. This is where he went awry. He didn't fight. You know, he went into a cave and he hid and God tried to get him to come out of the cave and God tried to, 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 to help him to understand things, but he was determined to wallow in his depression. And folks, you have to recognize when depression is trying to attack you and you have to fight that mentality. You have to fight that spirit. You have to put on the armor of God. You have to stand against the strategies of the devil. Amen. A few years ago, a good friend of mine that many of you know, Joseph Jennings. I had known Joseph for many years. Joseph was a gangbanger that grew up on the streets of, of Milwaukee area. He showed me bullet holes in his body. He had been shot several times. He had been stabbed. He had been burned. He had been in prison. He was, you talk about a tough guy. He was six, probably six, five, uh, easily over 300 pounds, a big, strong, tough guy. And, and, and all kinds of people tried to kill him, beat him up. He had uh, warrants out for his arrest, all kinds of things in his life. But he was big and he was tough and he was strong when those things came against him. And he, he, he overcame all of them. Shouldn't have been alive. And him and I hooked up many years ago when I was a youth pastor. And we used to go in schools and he'd tell some of the toughest kids in the school that wouldn't listen to his presentation to turn around and sit down and shut up. I'm coming here to talk to you. I'm not looking at the back of your head. And man, I'd start looking for the exits because I was sure there was a, 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 I'd never forget Pontiac Central High School, which doesn't really exist today as a high school, but picking out the toughest kid in the school and telling him to sit down and shut up. And I thought, man, we're going to have a, a riot on our hands here. And uh, I did that in many schools with him, watched him lead many kids to the Lord. And just a few years ago, we had him come and speak at Summerfest. And there was some wonderful results and God used him to touch a lot of people and and to bring a lot of people to Christ. But we also found out a little bit later on that there were Satanists that were at our Summerfest event that day. They were praying against us and praying against what we were doing. And a couple of weeks later, I got a text from Joseph. He said, pray for me. He says, I'm, I'm fighting and I'm battling something. And uh, I just respected his privacy. He didn't really want to elaborate on what he was going through, but I began to pray for him. Three weeks later, I got a phone call that Joseph had taken a gun and put it in his mouth and pulled the trigger and ended his life. Gangbangers couldn't kill him, but depression did. One of the strongest, toughest guys I ever met in my life. Loved God with all of his heart. I would have never guessed that this man was, if I thought for an inkling of a moment this is what he was battling, I would have got on a plane and flew down to spend time with him. But I thought, oh, this guy's big toe. I would, no way I would have guessed he was battling depression. All of us are 
not immune to this type of thing. Satan will come to steal and to kill and to destroy. Some of the symptoms of depression, I'll just run through them quickly. You have the outline here. But sometimes you'll have a trouble concentrating or have trouble concentrating or remembering details, making decisions, fatigue, irritability, restlessness. You know, one of the things that I've witnessed as a pastor over the years is there are people that are just faithful and committed to church. They're here all the time. And then they'll just disappear for a few months. And you can bet they're battling something like this. Because that's what this spirit will do. It will pull you away from the resources that you need most to get the help with what you're fighting with. And it will convince you that you're tired and, and, and there's no sense in, in praying. There's no sense in doing the, the things that you used to do. And, and it'll just take you into this, this fatigue and this tiredness. You'll have feelings of guilt and, and worthlessness and helplessness. And again, I, I spoke of this person that we dealt with years ago, probably one of the most pure and holy people I've ever met in my life but would call me and spend an hour on the phone telling me about the guilt that they had and the feeling of worthlessness that they had because of the depression that was overcoming their life. Persistent, sad, and anxious, and empty feelings. Sometimes a symptom of depression can just be a change in eating habits or sleeping habits, or you just begin to withdraw. Like I said, you withdraw from church, you withdraw from work, you withdraw from relationships and with people. If you find somebody that, that you haven't heard from in a while and they've pulled back from everything, there's a good chance that they're battling with something like this. And, you know, sometimes when I say change of eating habits, sometimes it's just putting on weight. I've gone through seasons in my life. You guys know my weight's been up and down and up and down. And when I'm putting on weight in the past, and I'm not doing that anymore. <laughs> Hallelujah. But uh, those are the times that I can sink into a depression because I lose energy and I'm tired and I, I get that fatigue and I feel bad about myself and my clothes don't fit and I'm, I'm not motivated to get up and do things because I can't do the things that I used to do. And those are the types of things that will, will lead you into a depressive state. Sometimes just a, 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 a radical change in your life, whether it's you lost a job. I, I went through a couple seasons in my life where I lost my job and I uh, looked through the newspaper every day they wanted five years of experience I didn't have. They wanted four years of education I didn't have. They wanted all these things. And I tell you, I don't know if you've ever been there before where you lost a job and you're looking for one and you're not qualified for anything that anybody's hiring for. You can get depressed real quick. Those are the type of things, loss of a loved one, loss of a job, loss of a family member. Uh, those type of things can, can cause depression. If you're having suicidal thoughts or attempts, obviously, Loss of motivation, showering, or uh, even even getting dressed in the morning, taking a shower, getting ready, getting getting up, and getting going in the morning. These are symptoms of depression. There are certain things, number three, that trigger depression, and I've already talked about some of these. Unhealthy diet or weight gain, especially uh, too many carbs, change of seasons. Uh, and one of the reasons that I wanted to talk about this this morning is because in a few weeks we'll turn our clocks back an hour and we're coming into a change of seasons where you won't see as much sunlight. You won't see the, the light of day. Some of you will go to, to work and it's dark and you'll come home from work and it's dark. Yeah. And you need to, to not be unaware of Satan's devices because he'll use these things in your life to bring depression unto you. Sometimes we get to the holiday season and I watch some of you because of something that's happened in your life or, or because of, of what Christmas means. It's not a happy event for everyone. And I watch people go into a depressive funk or you get to the anniversary of a day that somebody died in your life or it was somebody's birthday or whatever. These are things that you've got to recognize. These are triggers that Satan will use to bring depression upon you. And I watch so many people, especially here in Michigan in the wintertime, where you can go for four months without even seeing the sun. And you have to be aware that that can be a trigger for depression because the sun gives us certain, and this is a medical thing, it gives us certain vitamins like D and K that, that if you have a, a, a shortage of D, vitamin D and vitamin K in your body, you will become depressed. It's a medical issue that we have. That's why sometimes in the wintertime, I, I just got to go somewhere where the sun is shining. Sometimes I'll just go to the gym because I, I, I've got a uh, you know, I can sit under a heat lamp or something there, you know, just to, just to get the, the light of something that's going to give me some vitamin K or vitamin D in my life. 
Uh, lack of sleep, too much work, too much stress, personal loss, traumatic event we've talked about. You know, I read this this week and I, I thought it was interesting. An overexposure to bad news, you know, if, you, if you're just watching the news all the time and it, all of it's bad and tragic. And then somebody said one, one of the triggers to depression that they have found in many adults in our country is spending too much time on Facebook. I thought that was interesting. Because, you know, there's nothing but sometimes drama and bad news on Facebook. And I've watched people sit there for hours just looking through all of that stuff. That can lead to depression in your life. You talk about withdrawing, sitting in your house, looking at people's posts on Facebook can do that. Sometimes empty nest syndrome, chemical or hormone imbalance, drugs and alcohol use, these things can all trigger depression in our life. And one of the things that you need to understand with depression, number four, is depression is a sickness. I remember being in Bible school for uh, two years, and, and Kenneth Hagin used to always say these words. He'd say, you can be sick in your head just like you can be sick in your stomach. And I remember dealing with this individual that I talked about years ago, and, and, and their spouse would get mad at them, would get frustrated with them, almost like they wanted to look at their spouse and say, hey, snap out of this. What's wrong with you? Stop acting this way. And I had to pull them aside and say, look, they can't help with the way that they're acting. It is not a behavioral thing. It's not a choice or a decision. It's a sickness. I said, if they, if they had nausea and they were thrown up, would you tell them to stop doing that? You, you just can't look at it that way. If they had cancer and they were moaning in pain, would you tell them to stop? See, mental illness and depression, it's like every other sickness. In fact, uh, I've seen pictures of people where they do uh, uh, scans of their brain and you can see a person that's struggling with depression, the, the, their brain is actually altered. It's a physical condition. And so this is a medical thing oftentimes, but it's also a spiritual thing that we need to be aware of. And you know, sometimes even physical things are the result of spiritual attacks in our life. And so we need to, to, to understand that We've got to take care of this temple that we have because a lot of times depression or the things that we just read that causes it or triggers it is just a lack of us getting enough sleep, eating right, exercising. It's funny, one of the things I read this week was a, a source of vitamin D or K that I talked about that you need is found in, in dirt, in soil. And they said, no wonder so many people love to garden. It, 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 it tends to uh, refill their tank. You, you've got to be active. You've got to do things. You've got to fight through these things. There is a, a chemical in our body called serotonin that is where we get our motivation. It's where we get our energy. And I, I'm not a doctor. I'm just telling you some of the things that I've looked at and studied this week. And uh, every time you go out and you do things, you're depleting that supply of serotonin in your body. It's, it's what you take, uh, what you need to have the motivation and the energy to go out and work and, and go out and, and do things and be active in your life. And if you don't refill that serotonin within your body, you're, you're trying to run on an empty tank. And there are certain things that refill it, like sleep and proper diet and exercise and sunlight and things like that. And so if you don't live on serotonin and constantly re replenish that supply in your body, there's another chemical called adrenaline that will kick in. Now, adrenaline is in your body as a temporary thing for an emergency situation. It's amazing how God has designed our body. And you've, you've probably heard stories of people that, that uh, have seen somebody trapped under a car and they'll get this rush of strength and adrenaline where they can go and they can pick the car up and the person can get out from under the car. God has designed your body that way so that if there is a, a trauma, a tragedy, an emergency that you need some extra boost of strength, that that adrenaline will kick in. But it's not designed to live on that on a daily basis. And there are some people that are adrenaline junkies and they try to live on the adrenaline all of the time. And uh, adrenaline is actually, it's a, it's a chemical that if it's released in your body and it's not uh, worked out through exercise or activity or things like that, it, it becomes toxic to your body. And so these are things that you need to understand, that, that you need to replenish that serotonin in your body. Again, through rest, through exercise, through eating right, through, the, through taking care of, of your temple. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And your mind is a part of that temple. And just like you'd go to the gym to exercise, to take care of other parts of your body, your mind needs to be taken care of as well. 
And uh, we cannot overtax it and wear it down. There are spiritual steps that you can take to defeat depression. And Paul talked about these here in Philippians chapter 4. The first thing he says, think on these things. What you think on, what you meditate on is very important. Things that are just and true and, and lovely and honest and of a good report. Think on these things. Meditate on the Word of God. Meditate on the Bible. You know, I think sometimes people get tired of hearing pastors say, you got to read your Bible, you got to pray, you got to worship, you got to be in church. And I'm going to tell you all four of those things today because Paul writes it in here that those are things that will take care of your mental health. Paul says, if you do these things, the God of peace will guard your minds through Christ Jesus. And so we're looking to guard your mind from depression. And like I said, there's so many people, they pull away from the answer to their depression because they get depressed. And they're not motivated to pray and to read their Bible and go to church. But those are the very things that you need to keep you from being depressed. And this is how Satan works. That's why God says don't be ignorant of his schemes, his devices, his plans. He will pull you away from the things that will set you free from his attacks. It says guard your mind. Our mind is something that the Bible says as we think in our hearts, so are we. In other words... Our mind has such a, a power to cause how we live our life. The mind has the power and the ability to dictate how our life is lived. And so we have to guard what we think on. What we think on is what we will become, is what the Bible says. What you meditate on is, is what you will act on. What is, is in your thought life is what produces your habits and your lifestyle. And so the Bible says to guard your heart, guard your mind, guard it from the the thoughts of depression, thoughts of fear, thoughts of uh, of withdrawals, thoughts of uh, of all of these things that we've talked about here today. You've got to fight, fight these things in your life to be free. He says here that uh, don't be anxious for, for anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And so thanksgiving is an important part. Worship is an important part of our mental health. And I, again, I, I keep referencing this one individual that I, uh, because I, I spent hours and hours for years with this person trying to help them overcome their, their, their battle with depression. And there were times that we would pray together and I would hear them speak about what they were praying for. And all they were doing when they prayed was reciting their problems over and over and over and over again. And the Lord spoke to me one day and said, tell them not to pray. And I said, what are you talking about, Lord? And the Lord said, because as they pray, they are only uh, rehearsing their problems over and over and over again in their mind, and it's deepening their depression. Think about that for a minute. The Lord said, tell them to worship me. See? Because oftentimes that's what we do when we pray, right? We're just rehearsing all of the junk in our life. God, I'm struggling with this. And Father, I got this coming against me. Lord, I need help with it. And and what you're doing, if you're not careful, is you're getting overwhelmed by praying with your burdens and with your problems. That's why Jesus, when he told, told the disciples how to pray, he started with praise. Start this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Because if worship is not an ingredient in your prayer life, you will pray yourself into depression. Come on now. Amen. You will only recite and rehearse when you pray what's missing in your life and what you're lacking and what you don't have. Rather than taking time to take inventory of what I do have and what are all the good things in my life and what I'm grateful for and what I'm thankful for. And the Lord said, end this prayer this way, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever, God. So worship needs to be a major ingredient in our life if we're going to fight depression and overcome depression. Now, don't go out of here this morning and go, Pastor Terry said, don't pray. (laughs) Because that's not what I'm saying this morning. But I'm saying to make sure that worship is an ingredient in your prayer life. And that your prayer life is not just this rehearsed list of everything that's wrong in your life. Because if you're not careful, if you're doing that, you're not thinking on things that are just and lovely and pure and honest and of a good report. You have to guard your mind even when you pray. 
Amen. And then it says, toward the end of this passage, Paul says, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. So Paul is, in essence here, he's saying, be together with other believers. Find a mentor. Find somebody that can be your shepherd, your pastor. And, and, and watch them and do the things that they do, the things which you've heard, he says. So, so he's encouraging them to be in a place where they're listening to the teaching of the Word of God and they're seeing other people worship God and serve God. These things which you've heard and seen and learned, a place where you can learn, do these things. Uh, that seems to me like he's describing church just a little bit. And so I think being in church is an important thing. I believe that one of the things that's important is is to give your anxiety to God. Paul starts out, he says, be anxious for nothing. Peter said it this way. I love his version. He says, humble yourselves under God's mighty hand that he might exalt you in due time, casting all of your care upon him for he cares for you. You need to roll those burdens over on the Lord. One of the reasons that you battle depression sometimes is because you're carrying too many burdens. And sometimes you're carrying burdens that are not your own burdens. And you need to learn how to take those things and cast them upon the Lord or roll them off on the Lord. I I heard an example one time, an analogy uh, of a camel that, you know, it said uh, in the Bible that a camel had to to try to get through the eye of a needle. I'm trying to remember the story, but it's impossible for a rich man uh, to get into heaven, uh, just like a a camel getting through the eye of a needle. And, and, And the camel, and I'm not obviously quoting that exactly the way I should. But for the camel to get through an eye of a needle, the eye of the needle was every major city in Bible times were surrounded by a great wall. And during the day, that wall had a huge gate that they would open and people would come in and go out and come in and go out. But inside that gate, there was a little door that the gates would be closed at night. And the only way to get into the city was through that little door. And if somebody showed up with this big camel that was loaded down with all of their belongings... To get through that little door, that door was called the eye of the needle. And the only way to get through that little door with that camel was to have that camel load everything off of its back, get down on its knees, and crawl through that little door. And that's a great example of what the Lord is saying here. Humble yourself under God's mighty hand and cast your cares upon him, for he cares for you. And so this is, this is how God wants us to stay free from uh, depression and other things that we would battle in our mind is to humble ourselves. Yes. You know, again, don't don't try to be big and tough and say, I got this, I can handle this. Of depression, I don't battle depression, not me. I think if all of us would would be honest and humble this morning, we'd all admit we've gone through seasons yes. that these these symptoms and triggers describe us in our life at one time or another. And so you've got to humble yourself and cast those cares upon the Lord. Offload those burdens onto the Lord because it says He cares for you. Amen. And then finally, uh, I like this. Find a Titus, a person in your life that will comfort you. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 6, Paul wrote these words. Big Paul, the greatest Christian that ever lived, right? He says, uh, but God who comforts the depressed comforted us by the coming of Titus. Is it possible that Paul said he went through a season of depression here? And God sent a man named Titus to comfort him. We all need a Titus in our life, amen? But if you are too proud to admit that you're struggling with depression, like statistics say, what was it, 67 or 66% of people in our nation, 64, do not admit they need help, go untreated with their mental struggles, you got to admit sometimes and humble yourself and ask for some help. Finally, this morning, one of my favorite Psalms, and I'm sure yours as well, Psalm 23, the first three verses, it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I remember years ago, Spencer was young and went to a Christian school. We were going to school one day. And, uh, he was, one of the things he had to do was memorize the 23rd Psalm. And 
It was a season of my life where I was just busy and running and going here and there and just overwhelmed by everything going on in my life and going on with the church. And I, I think we were praying together or something on our way to school. And I was reciting this, you know, Lord, thank you that you make us to lie down in green pastures and beside still waters. Thank you, Lord. We can walk through the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil. You anoint our head with oil. Our cup runs over. I was just going through the whole thing. And I got done and he says, Dad, you forgot he restores our soul. And it just hit me like a ton of bricks because I needed to hear that at that moment. Because my soul was overwhelmed, my soul was weak, my soul was beaten down. And when I say my soul, our, our soul is made up of our mind, our emotions, our desires. And I want you to know this morning that God restores our soul. We talk about how He heals our body. We talk about how He fills our spirit, how we become born again in our spirit. But God is also a healer and restorer of your soul. And He wants to restore your soul. Our emotional and mental health is as important to God as our spiritual and physical health is. He desires to do that. And so what you need to do is find out in your life what fills your, your soul, what, what, what restores your soul, what fills your tank, if you will. There are things that you know that you do that, that, that it, it's good for your mental health, that it just restores that serotonin in your life, whether it's rest, recreation, maybe it's fishing, maybe it's jogging, maybe it's reading. I don't know what it is for you. For everybody, it's different. Sometimes for me, it's just cutting the grass. Uh, it's weird, just the hum of the lawnmower, just out there by myself. It, it, it is. It can be therapeutic. Even, even uh, doing some projects around the house that fills my tank. And so find out what those things are and allow the Lord to use those things to restore your soul. On the other side, there are things that empty your tank and drain your tank. And sometimes it's not things, it's people that empty your tank and drain your tank. And when God says, guard your mind, sometimes you got to guard yourself from those things and limit those things. There are times where, where there are just certain people that, that I have to take a break from from time to time. And especially if it's somebody that's battling depression, because they will pull you into that depression if you're not careful. You have to take those things in, in little doses. And so find out what restores your soul. Another translation of this Psalm 23 verse 1 says, The Lord is my shepherd. He's all I need. And so you need to get that mentality in your life. God is all you need. Because all of these other things that you think you need are, are, are wreaking havoc on your soul. And sometimes your mental health. I need more money. I need more hours. I need more time in the day. I need Those are not what you need. The Lord is my shepherd. He's all I need. Amen. And if you keep that focus in your life, if our spiritual commitments are in the right priority, then God will restore your soul. But if you're at a point in your life where spiritual commitments are adding to your anxiety, adding to your stress, then there's something out of balance and something wrong with your life. And I've, I've seen people do this before. You know, Pastor, I just got too much going on and, and, and just having a, 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 to come to church or be involved in church, that's just another commitment in my life that I'm, I'm overwhelmed right now and I can't handle if spiritual commitments are, 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 are things that you're pulling back from because uh, you think that that's adding to anxiety in your life, then the problem is not the spiritual things. The problem is the other things that have you so overloaded that you think a spiritual thing would add more, add more anxiety to your life. I don't have time for, for Bible study. I don't have time to read. I don't have time to pray. Can you see how Satan works? Those are the very things that will refill your tank. And you're so busy with the things that are emptying your tank that you think, if, if I take time to do those things, then, then, then it'll put more stress on me and more anxiety on me. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Amen. Those are the things that will refill your tank. And so if that's your mentality, then the Lord is probably not shepherding you. Because the psalmist wrote, the Lord's my shepherd. He's all I need. And when you think you need all these other things, and you don't need God because He's going to make you uh, more overwhelmed and burned out, then the Lord's probably not your shepherd at that moment of your life. I'm not saying you're going to hell. I'm just saying 
that, that if the Lord is your shepherd, he's all you need. Amen. And he will make you to lie down in green pastures. And he will bring you, lead you beside the still waters. And he will restore your soul. And he will fill your cup until it runs over. Hallelujah. So if you're burned out and anxious and overwhelmed and depressed, is the Lord your shepherd? Are you allowing the Lord to shepherd you? Because if the Lord is shepherding you, he will restore your soul. Amen. If you're not lying down in green pastures and your waters are not still that you're being led beside, then the Lord is not shepherding you like he should be. And let me just tell you this, something I've learned in, in, in pastoring for 30 years. Shepherding is a two-way commitment. You got to want to be shepherded. Amen. Amen. I mean, there's a lot of people that I want to shepherd, but if they don't let me shepherd them, there's not a, a one thing I can do to help them. And the Lord wants to shepherd you, but you have to say, the Lord is my shepherd. And if, if your cup's not running over, if goodness and mercy is not following you all the days of your life, then you need to check and say, am I allowing the Lord to shepherd me? Am I allowing the Lord to lead my life? Am I trusting that he is all that I need? Amen. Let's bow our heads this morning. Father, we're so grateful for your goodness in our lives, Lord. And I'm so glad, God, that you're interested in my entire being to preserve my spirit, my soul, and my body, Lord. God, I, I just thank you for your goodness and your mercy. And I do believe that the devil is real and that there are forces that are trying to steal from us and destroy us and, yes, even kill us, Lord. God, I pray that we would not be ignorant to his schemes and his plotting, Lord. But God, we would be mindful of these battles, spiritually and physically, that we face. And what their intentions are, Lord. To separate us from you. To bring destruction in our life. Help us, God, to have the desire the strength to fight these things, Lord, I pray. Help us, God, to stay in your word. Help us to guard our minds. Help us to cast our cares upon you. Help us to worship you and to be thankful. Help us to find a, a, a person that we can follow, Lord God. Help us to find somebody who's a source of comfort in our life, Lord. God, help us to allow you to shepherd our lives, Lord, and to lead us, Lord into green pastures and still waters and restore our soul, Father. God, we worship you this morning, Lord. Hallelujah. Father, I pray if there's anybody here today that's never given their life to you, Lord, that they would put their pride aside today and humble themselves and admit they need you, Father. That, God, none of us are too big and strong that we don't need your help but that we would admit, God, that we need you. Well, heads are bowed and people are praying right now, Lord, if there's anybody in this place that has the guts to be transparent and to admit that they're lost without you, Father, and that they would want to open their heart and their life and receive you, God, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that they would do that today, that they would press through their pride and their fear and open their heart to receive you. Well, heads are bowed and people are praying. Perchance, is there anybody like that this morning that would like to humble themselves and take a step of faith and say, Pastor, that's me. I need God in my life. And I'm not afraid to admit it. I'm not too prideful to say, Pastor, lead me in a prayer today. Let me tell you what comes next. If you, if you need that prayer in your life, we're not going to point you out or call you forward or put you on the spot. We're all going to pray that prayer together with our heads remain bowed we're not here to embarrass anybody, but we want you to experience the goodness and the mercy of God. But I'm going to ask you to take one step of faith and just right now while people are praying for you, not judging you, not analyzing you, but we're here, Lord, to lead you into God's presence. If that's you and you say, Pastor, say that prayer for my benefit today. I need God. Just lift your hand up and you can put it right back down. Pastor, that's me. Lead us in that prayer this morning. Amen. I see a couple hands today. So anybody else, I want to give you that opportunity to have the guts to join these courageous souls and say, Pastor, lead me in that prayer today. I need God in my life. As I look around one more time, is there anybody else that says, Pastor, that's me. I need God in my life today. 
I need my soul to be restored. I need my spirit to be set free. Hallelujah. Well, while heads are bowed, we're going to pray right now. If that's you, whether you raised your hands or not, it is, is not as important as praying this prayer right now. So I want you to say this prayer with me. We're all going to pray it together. Say it from the depth of your heart, and God will meet you right where you're at this morning. Just say, God, I need you. I admit that I am weak, and I want you to strengthen my life. I open my heart, and I lay it before you today. I ask you to come and live in me. Forgive me for the way that I've lived. I admit that it's sin. And I ask you, Lord, to wash me, to cleanse me, to restore me from the evils of this world. God, I give my life to you. And I make a commitment to live for you from this day forward. Help me and strengthen me. Lead me and guide me. Be my God and I will be your child. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Father, anybody that has prayed that prayer for the first time, the third time that needed you today, God, visit them in a special way, I pray. Wrap your loving arms around them right now, God. Let your love and your joy and your peace overwhelm their heart the way that anxiety has overwhelmed their heart, God. God, restore their soul. God, lead them in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Make them to lie down in green pastures and lead them beside still waters, Lord. God, I pray today, God, that goodness and mercy would follow them all the days of their life and they would dwell in the house of the Lord forever, God, I pray. Lord, we'll give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. It's extravagant. It doesn't make sense.